morning everyone i'm just going to wait for a few more people to hop on and then we'll get cracking thank you marco i am deliberately wearing a different christmas hat every day this week because <laughs> that's the sort of person i am absolutely mad right i will get cracking and then we can catch other people up as we go along so if you haven't been to tuesday or monday session um my name's vicky we are doing paper one question five descriptive writing we are doing uh aqa because that's the most popular one and by quite margin so um, we did narrative writing yesterday and we did paper one question four on Monday. Um, so we're going to be primarily looking at the big differences between narrative and descriptive writing because it's easy to get confused. And then if you haven't been and you don't know who I am, I'm sure some of you are already sick of me saying this. My name is Vicky. I did English language and linguistics at University of York a few years ago and I trained as an English teacher as well. Um, so I'm a qualified teacher. Um, and I've done over 650 private lessons on my tutor and I've done about just over 750 in total since September last year. Right, let us get cracking. So we are going to be looking primarily at the structure of descriptive writing because I think the structure is really difficult with descriptive writing. It's relatively I think narrative writing is much more straightforward in terms of structure. Um, interested to hear your thoughts as well on that as well. So, first question for you um, is, how is descriptive writing different to narrative writing? What do you know about it, if anything? What sort of things would you expect to do in descriptive writing that you wouldn't expect to in narrative writing? Or what would you do in narrative writing? that you wouldn't do in descriptive writing. So um, you can pop questions, answers to that question in the Q&A chat, uh, the Q&A function or the chat function. I'll check both of them. Um, Olivia is also here with us um, from my tutor just to keep an eye on things and make sure that I'm covering everything. I will go through and answer questions as much as I can throughout the session. Um, right no speech and descriptive that's interesting right so you can have speech and description but if you are going to do speech and description we're talking sort of like a small sentence really so yeah generally <clears throat> um no speech you'll probably find a lot of teachers will say just don't do any speech at all because there are like four different rules that you've got to get right for using speech so sort of if you are going to do speech make sure you know what you're doing because it's an easy way to trip yourself up on the spag marks narrative writing is a story absolutely description is going into detail would you describe a picture or write a story good question so um you can essentially be given either you will be told whether it is a description task you are doing or whether it is a narrative task I will grab an AQA past paper for you in a minute to show you what that might look like. Um, right. Look at the chat. Yeah, so with description, you usually have the image to describe, but not always. Um, less action and more focus. Um, yep, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, there is no plot, essentially, which is why it's a bit trickier to structure. Um, yeah, zooming in and out on things, using good vocabulary. I think there's more of a craft to descriptive writing personally. Right, so we did narrative writing yesterday. Um, I will quickly grab an AQA pass paper to show you what it actually looks like in the paper. Right. So this was one of the rare times that uh, AQA decided to have a picture for this, uh, the story rather than the, the description. So write a story about time travel as suggested by this picture um, and then or 
describe life as you imagine in 200 years time so that's that one that's the most recent paper that AQA have actually published on their website for the public um, let's have a look at June 2018 quickly so this is the one that I've taken inspiration from today so write a description of an old person as suggested by this picture you usually have a picture for the descriptive writing but not always and then you've got write a story about a time when things turned out unexpectedly um, so generally you get some sort of instruction or a title or um, a sentence starter for your story for the narrative writing. You usually get a picture for the descriptive writing. Ofqual have said that AQA cannot always guarantee it's going to be one narrative writing and one descriptive writing. So you have to be prepared for them to, there to be potentially two narrative writing and two descriptive writing tasks for you to choose from. Right, and there was an ask about the four rules of speech. I will go over that towards the end of the session. I'll leave it up so I remember that I need to do that. We'll get cracking and then I'll talk to you about it a little bit later on when we've got time at the end. So the big, I was going to say problem, and it's not a problem. The big difference is that it's harder to structure descriptive writing because it's not quite as clear. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of um, options as to how you might want to do it. Um, so... The big fall down and misconception that students do in the exam is they start on the descriptive writing task and then without really realising that they're doing it, they then turn it into a story. And you are going to lose marks if you do that because you are not um, doing tone effectively, you're not writing for the specific audience, you're not doing the target you've been asked to do. So be very, very careful that you don't do that because it's an easy thing to do and it's an easy trip up to lose a fair chunk of marks. Right, so as I mentioned, structuring is really tricky. So yesterday I showed you my little story mountain. Please do not do a story mountain. We are not doing a story. So the two things that you're probably likely going to be given is a picture which says, describe the individual, or describe the scene as suggested by this picture. So being prepared for one of those is really good. Now, when I um, was training, there was quite a big debate about the June 2018 paper about the picture of that man writing a description based on him. And quite a lot of us as teachers sat there and went, wow, that is, that is hard. And we sort of sat there and had to go ourselves. And it is really tricky. If you've just got a portrait of a person, you haven't got a lot potentially to talk about. It's really, really tricky. So hence why my model today is going to be very, very similar, just to show you what it might look like, because I think definitely one of the hardest tasks they've given in the exam in terms of your choices. So in terms of... Um, how you are going to structure stuff. I've got one which is, you could use for both essentially, individual or scene. I think this one sits nicer with an individual or a couple of people. Um, and this one sits better with scenes. But it's completely up to you. You can adapt it, you can mold it to what you want to do. So again, I've just got five um, features aim for five chunky paragraphs as your bare minimum if you want to add in more absolutely fantastic please do that don't feel that this plan is there to constrict you because it's not it's there to help you you can bend it and do extra creative stuff with it and that's absolutely fine right before I move on so when you write the story how close to the question does it have to be how much can you diverge from the main topic? Right, we've got another how long is a piece of string question. So what I say to my students is particularly if you are going for the picture, if there's something in that picture that you can't quite see or you think would be there logically and it fits into what you are writing about, then you can write that. Um, so for example, um, 
I've got a picture that I do of a bus crash that's sort of along several carriageways and it's right next to the sea. Um, but you can only see a very small portion of the sea in the corner of the picture. And you could potentially go off and talk about the sea, what the sea's doing and how different it is to what's going on on land. So <clears throat> as long as it makes sense, as long as it is logical, you can. But don't add in anything bonkers. Um, make sure that it is still appropriate to task. Would you recommend doing a story or descriptive writing in the exam? It's completely up to you. And I think it's personally down to personal preference um, and how you write. I've got some students who much prefer the descriptive writing. They get on better with that. Most tend to plump for the narrative. I think perhaps narrative is slightly easier from a structural point of view, um, but I think it's whatever suits you the best. And I definitely wouldn't go into the exam and say I'm doing the narrative writing come what may, because you might get in there and realise you've got two descriptive tasks. Um, I've been told that it's a good way to start is by asking, what's that noise? Is that fine? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good starter. Do we write what we choose? Yes, so you get an option of uh, question 5.1 or question 5.2. Um, and then you just have to specify which one you're doing in the margin and uh, then you get cracking. Right, I think I've covered everything in the Q&A so far. So structure. So this is, I think, better for individuals personally. Um, I think it's easier for individuals. Um, so. First paragraph, talking about the big picture and making sure that you are considering the general atmosphere um, and not specifically focusing on one thing in tiny, tiny detail. Then in your next paragraph, zoom in on it, that really, really small detail. Then change perspective. So if you've got a picture of someone, write a paragraph of what they're thinking in their perspective which is a really nice advanced way to show off your structural features to change perspective. That's really, um, really sort of top end and do another zoom and then do an emotional response. So consider how the person in that picture is feeling or how the reader is affected by it. I quite frequently get students who, when I say, how does this make you feel? I have students who say, well, to be honest with you, Vicky, it doesn't really make me feel that much because I'm not really that bothered by it. And that's absolutely fine. And I think it's completely normal to think it's just a picture and that's fine. And if you don't feel anything in particular to it, not a problem, then think about what might somebody else think? So perhaps think about instead of thinking sort of what a teenager your age would think, perhaps what someone older would think or someone younger. And I think so as you get older, these sorts of things get easier to do. And I think when I was your age, I would have struggled to have done emotional responses on a personal level. But now I find it quite nice and straightforward to do and actually really enjoy doing it. I think it comes with maturity. Um, so if you are stuck in a, oh, I don't, I, this doesn't really make me feel anything. Think about what somebody else might feel and then you can write it as impersonal so if you're doing analysis you can say this makes the reader think this makes the reader feel as impersonal or you can say I think I feel and that's fine as well and they are not going to read your exam paper then come and find you and double check that you actually believe that so as long as it works and it makes sense that's fine right chat can everybody else hear me all right? Or is it just Ranjeev who's struggling? Yeah, fab. So it's just them that are struggling. Right, okay, that's fine. The other one in terms of structure is this one, which I think is quite nice. And again, I would be flexible with it. <clears throat> um, so we've got the big picture. Um, then we've got smell or hear. So spending time choosing one of those two and doing a paragraph entirely on that. And then the next big picture, looking at a different perspective. If you're in that picture and you turn to another direction, what are you going to see if you look over there rather than here? Um, then choose smell or hear, the one that you haven't done. Do another paragraph. 
um, and then in small detail you're zooming in on something specific. I've got a really really nice um, sort of quantity fireworks display picture I use and that's quite a nice one for smell or hear. If you look at it think there's nothing interesting here to write about for smell and or hear because some pictures don't lend themselves nicely to that. Do another small detail instead, be flexible with it. But I think usually you can find one smell or one here in a picture that you can do nicely. Right. Okay, would this be to describe a picture? Yeah. So they're all set up to describe a picture. Um, it's rather unlikely you will get um, you will get an instruction like in the November 2018 paper. But essentially, you can absolutely use this structure for the same thing, but you are essentially making your own visual picture in your head rather than being it being given to you. So write what some, the world's going to look like in 200 years. You're immediately going to pop up with ideas that what the world will look like. You can then jot them down and then you can consider them in sort of wide and then more de less more detailed. Um, so it works either way, I think. Um, right, okie doke. So, same as yesterday then. So, our toolbox, if you like. The descriptors are exactly the same as narrative writing. So A5, which is 24 marks for content and organisation and 16 marks for spelling, punctuation and grammar. So essentially we need all of these things in here to get a really, really fantastic grade. We need that, we need all of these. And the ones where people struggle the most, I think are probably a range of punctuation and by that I mean advanced punctuation. So colons, semicolons, brackets, speech i'll go over speech now um and the other one being structural features some things you will do like start ending setting <clears throat> but doing things like flashbacks a short paragraph for effect um changing perspective those are sort of the really showy off give me top marks um sort of screaming at the examiner right let me go through the rules of speech so rules of speech is I think we all assume that speech is quite straightforward and it is once you know what you're doing but there's a few rules you have to abide by so the obvious one is speech marks so let's let's go for Very simple one, that's brilliant, said Vicky. So that's our speech marks. Our speech marks are around um, the speech itself. Number two, your, when you open speech marks, you must use a capital letter. So the T there is capitalised. If I shifted this around and said, Vicky said, that's brilliant. I'd still need a capital letter, even though it's technically in the middle of a sentence. So that's number two. Number three is punctuation for speech should come before your closing um, speech mark. So if you've got something in the middle of the sentence and it's not an exclamation mark, it's not a question mark, we just put a comma and that's fine. If you wanted it to be, for this, an exclamation mark might work really nicely. So put an exclamation mark there, brilliant. That's that one done. Now, if you've got it so it comes halfway through a sentence, so punctu not punctuation, speech um,
So speech included in a sentence that's already started, um, we need to put a comma. So we put our comma in there. And I think I've got everything. Ah, no, I haven't. The last one is new speaker, new line. So let's move this up a bit so it's not going to fall off the bottom. So Vicky said that's brilliant. Um, and then something rubbish like instead of starting here, um, instead of starting, thanks, I really appreciate that. said Hayley you don't start it on the same sentence on the same line rather it has to go on the next line because it's a new speaker speaking so that's all of the rules and once you know them it's quite straightforward but I would be very careful that if you are going to do this in the exam make sure that you know this back to front if you just want to do a short sentence where you are just doing one speaker or perhaps somebody calling out, then I'd, I'd go for that. Don't Your teachers will tell you not to do too much speech anyway, because once you've shown off that you know how to do it, it doesn't get you many marks because being able to do language devices and structural features and detailed description is really tricky to do if you've got people speaking all the way through. So hence why we sometimes say stay away from it. Right, let me just take the questions and right. Done the four rules for speech. How can you change perspective? I'm going to show you how to do that in my model. So that is coming shortly. Um, is sophisticated vocabulary needed to get a good mark? Yes, absolutely. Could you write a prologue? you won't have time to do a prologue and to do it well because a prologue will probably should consist of several pages um, so instead of doing a prologue what I would do is a short flashback or flash forward depending on whether you want to approach it from looking into the future or looking into the past I do that instead of a prologue because otherwise you will run out of time I'm going to give an example of changing perspectives um, are we going to do Kahoot based on this? We're not. I've got a Slido to do today. You can write in first person narrative. That is absolutely fine. Um, the YouTube channel that we have is just my tutor. Then if you go on and click on uh, whichever subject you want and the playlists, uh, you'll be able to find all of the sessions we've done. What are conventions and is language devices basically figurative language? Yeah, absolutely. So personification, pathetic fallacy, repetition, oxymoron, metaphors, similes, all of that, those are language devices, which are all, most of them are figurative language. Conventions. So a convention is when a genre convention. So for example, if you are doing uh, Gothic writing, you might expect to see um, some language, which is really dark. Um, having a lot of information withheld a lot of emphasis on the setting and the weather so things that fit into particular character categories that you would expect so with fiction essentially with this you just need to make sure that you are writing a story essentially and you are writing it in a style that you would expect to see if you picked up a book that's what that means really genre conventions is something which you'd more likely look at in english literature really Right, let's crack on. So, as I mentioned, this is the picture I've taken inspiration from and I've chosen this absolutely beautiful portrait. So, the question we will be working on is write a description of an old woman as suggested by this picture. So, what I'd like you to do for me please is to go to the Q&A or the chat, whichever I don't mind, and tell me what sorts of things you pick out what stands out to you that you might want to focus on if I said to you go off and write me a description right now what sorts of things would you be jotting down in your plan
wrinkled skin yep absolutely clothing hair facial features yep in your answer can you say the writer has used language device of a metaphor you can but not in your writing task so not in this one because that's an analysis one so questions two three or four you can write that um fantastic wrinkled skin her eyes yeah there's a redness around them isn't there might suggest she was crying sort of the staring nature earrings yeah absolutely they're quite dainty as well which i quite like um yeah she looks quite solemn doesn't she um paper white hair that's interesting see i go for gray i think there's a lot of different colors going on in there eyes that behold the knowledge of the universe i've included something similar in my model anxious interesting um how do you describe facial features i'm going to show you how to do it in a moment so don't worry that's coming right let's have a look in the chat do 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 do, do. wrinkly her coat yeah i think her coat is really interesting um worried yeah she appears quite wealthy and well dressed absolutely i agree um strict maybe concentrating wisdom knowledgeable yeah fantastic comprehensive nature she looks kind of regal yeah she does um she looks because she is so well dressed and i think sort of well put together she looks sort of slightly higher status than perhaps some other people don't they right i'm going to answer the question about careers towards the end of the lesson i will do that i promise if i forget shout at me right so i'm going to be using this structure opening big pictures zooming in changing perspective zooming emotional response so i will show you the things that i've picked out so the things that particularly struck me were her eyes and her wrinkles um and the lighting i think how the lighting falls in this picture and lighting is really important she is up against a black background so she is even more striking than what she would be before, which I think is really important. Um, and there's a very, very clear contrast between the two and particularly how the light hits her cheeks and her brow and the ends of her nose. Personally, I find really interesting. And I think there's a lot to play with with that. So I've already basically chosen my two zoom ins my the eyes and the wrinkles that's what i'm going for my opening i'm going to start with the lighting because i think you can play about with how the lighting strikes in one area but not in another area um and why that's interesting and essentially you've got a large surface area that you can talk about if you're focusing on the lighting um for the change of perspective i'm going to be questioning what she is thinking about potentially what she's looking at as well um, and why that is um, important, how that helps us with her characterization as well. And then almost like a conclusion, really, after I've written all of these things, how do all of these ideas combined together make the observer feel? So once we've got through all of that, how do we feel about this woman? Do we like her? Do we not like her? If that's the case, why not? So essentially, putting all those puzzle pieces together and then deciding your own opinion essentially is what I'm asking you to do. So this is the mark scheme, which we went over yesterday. And I don't think there's anything on here that we haven't already mentioned. Clear phone flow and links between paragraphs, which I'm gonna show you how to do as well. Um, range of structural features. And then we've just got a range of sentences and a range of punctuation as well we need to be including our um proud smile and our stop fares as well right okay so i didn't have time to do a bit of live modeling yesterday but essentially i've already written written my model but i'm going to write the first paragraph with you guys so you can see the thoughts that i had whilst i was actually writing it rather than just reading it out to you let me just check the Q&A before we go. So could you add context without it being in the photo, for example, talking what she's thinking about? Yes, you absolutely could. Um, smile concealing her misery. That's interesting. 
Lovely stuff. Right. Let's look at the chat. Looking over memories. Yeah, that's really nice as well. So I'm going for something which is I'm going for thought provoking rather than dramatic here and something that's quite quiet and quite considered. And when you've got something like this, I think it's really important to make sure that you do that and you don't go over the top because it's easy to do. Um, and it all sort of limits how successful your writing is in a way. So to start off with, I'm just going to go for something really, really boring, essentially. In a cold room, she sat. So the first thing that I've done to jazz this sentence up a bit is instead of saying she sat in a cold room, I've moved in a cold room to the start. So we've got what we call a fronted adverbial. So the description as to what she's doing and how she's sitting comes before we say that she is sitting, just to make it slightly more interesting. Then I'm then going to add a semicolon and essentially add some description descriptive. Um, adjectives and that be it and that is my first short sharp sentence I've already showed off that I know how to use a semicolon I fiddled about with having a fronted adverbial and it generally makes it more interesting to read but I'm going for something which is quite stark quite chilled out and essentially not going wow I'm writing here I go it's quite quiet quite subtle so peacefully, we'll spell peacefully correctly. That's always a good start. Peacefully, she folded her hands and placed them. I've got myself a new wireless keyboard and I've not quite got the hang of it yet. I apologize. And placed them subtly posing so I'm implying that she knows she is being watched and she's being careful but I'm not saying that that is the case and again I've gone for a sentence that is very similar in terms of its structure rising from the silent darkness so now I'm starting to reference the light a beacon of the past. I'm using a metaphor to describe her as a beacon of the past because she's an old woman. Um, extended above an artifact to learn from. So as some of you chose when I said, tell me what you're thinking of, you said, well, she's very old, She's up, so she must have some wisdom. She looks like she's very knowledgeable. So I'm starting to imply that, that she's essentially something to learn from. I've gone for the choice of artefacts as well, because artefacts are things that we see in a museum and have been saved and preserved because they are old and rare. So that's why I've gone for that as a choice for my metaphor. I'm then going to extend my metaphor a little bit. Um, so she both ignited and extinguished curiosity of the secrets she kept. So again, I am starting to talk about the light a bit more and I've managed to get an oxymoron in because ignited and extinguished are complete opposites and for what I'm going for here is essentially that some of the secrets that she keeps are really interesting and we want to know more about and some of the other secrets we don't want to acknowledge that they're there so that's my thought choice behind that um, and then I'm getting in some advanced punctuation in here again at last, which I think is sort of when I wrote this, I thought, hmm, we don't really use that anymore. It's perhaps a bit dated. Alas, it is not polite to intrude. So here, essentially, I'm saying her secrets are really interesting. Some of them are really interesting and I want to know everything about them. 
but as someone watching I know that I shouldn't be asking all of those questions essentially then I'm going to take this a bit further and actually start talking about the lighting in more detail so rays of light dance are getting in some personification across her face highlighting so again I've chosen another word which is very very close to um, essentially I've got a semantic field going on I've got ignited extinguished darkness I've got loads of different words that relate specifically to light and shade essentially highlighting her orbs that could cut glass so here what I'm doing is I am implying that she can see straight through you and know everything about you and what you're thinking. So by, by that, I'm the metaphor being orbs for eyes. And then I've used some really harsh sounds, could cut glass, which sort of simulate the idea of being actually cut. Then I'm gonna start off with another adverb to get cracking so quietly the acknowledgement um, of focus crawled onto her face with a wry smile to be caught sight of in the corner of her mouth so here I'm actually starting to acknowledge that not only is she just potentially thinking about what you are thinking, she knows that she's being watched and she knows that she's got the upper hand. And we've got this sort of idea that's sort of crawling on, as so it's a gradual realisation. Um, right. Above lay entwined silver and grey hair, ruffled yet contained. So by ruffled what I mean is that there's obvious shape and there's obvious strands that are going and overlaying in different areas but it still looks sophisticated. Mirroring the rough control let me change my page. Oh. That um, control that the um, owner had over viewers. I've just twiddled that a little bit because I didn't like what I've written. Right. The gleam, again, I've got another word relating to light. Uh, the gleam softened. Again, some personification going on there. Soften the contrast between dim landscape and her vibrant plaintive, I knew I was gonna spell that wrong, plaintive face. Now, I wrote something else and then I decided it would go better at the end. So, beneath the glow, hmm, beneath the glow soon reached darkness as we all would one day. Yeah, that still works, I think, just about. So now then sort of relating to sort of metaphorical death in a way, which is a bit bleak. Right. Let's have a quick look. Oh, is it better to write in past or present? It's completely up to you. Um, I think for descriptive, it's easier to write in present personally, but that doesn't mean you have to do it in present and do it in past. Would there be a comma after above? 
yes and I've written the comma in and then decided I didn't like it and then thought, no, it should be there. So well noticed, I was debating that. So um, also do you lose marks for using outdated words like ain't? Ain't isn't a outdated word, it's a slang word. So you'd lose marks for slang, but if it is in speech, then you can get away with that and that's fine. It helps with characterization. If the picture were for narrative writing, could you make the person a character from a book? Yeah, you could use them as a character um, if the picture is for narrative writing or if you've got a lot of pictures, um, not a lot of pictures, a lot of people in that picture, you could choose one person to talk about in detail. Can you use both present and past in the same piece? You can, but I think it would be easier to stick to one because it can get very messy very quickly, particularly when you're in an exam and you haven't got a lot of time to edit. Right. OK, so essentially that's what I'm thinking for my per first paragraph. I will now read you the rest of it. And that's sort of what's gone through my mind as I've written it. So. I've read, I've typed that bit up. So trickling down like a cool spring, I faltered at her imperfections. The gentle creasings of the skin withheld the wisdom of age and perhaps myths and legends too. The freckled cheeks of age refuted all claims that she was perfectly imperfect, but imperfectly perfect. Now, I wrote this and got my partner to read it. And he said, I've got absolutely no idea why on earth you've written that because it doesn't make sense. And it makes sense in my sense, in, in my head, as in being perfectly imperfect, meaning that she is imperfect and that's brilliant, rather than she is imperfectly perfect, which suggests that she has a fault. Um, so being imperfect, meaning that there is something wrong, essentially, but being imperfect in a perfect way is essentially meaning that that is good. And it's good to be imperfect. So that's what I mean by that. And looking back on it, I think I probably I forgot it was there and I forgot to edit it out. And I think I probably get rid of that in my editing stage, to be honest with you, because I think it's a little bit too complex to get your head around. Society's perception of beauty is far from the wrinkles of age. However, many could see that her face's insecurities outweighed such a concept. The pleats stood vertically between nose and mouth as if a bridge before curving under to form the top lip which had served her thoughts so well. Now, this is going to be my change in perspective. As she sat, she contemplated her life's achievements. She questioned, who will remember me when I'm gone? There should be a question mark there. And there should also be Let's turn that into speech. Excluding her aging son, she has very little to offer the world as a gift. Had she used her time wisely? A resounding doubt boomed in her head and came forth. All this time she thought wasted. She had chosen the enjoyment of social gatherings over dedicating her time to those in need. And now, could she salvage it? Her bones ached deep beneath the skin's surface. Although time was running short, a flicker of determination could be seen in the mirror to the soul, her eyes. In spite of her age, there was one body part, or rather two, that were timeless. They had recorded the determination and love of the world, as well as the hatred and lies. These stories appeared to roll around like the waves of an expansive ocean and true to form, the, the glisten light bounced back to humanity. The surrounding skin had softened with age, creating a nest of comfort despite the neighbouring troubles and concerns. One could say it created a buffer between her and the rest of the world. If one could grant or bestow a gift, I might perhaps choose a dove. So I've changed it now where I am directly giving an emotional response here. And I make it very clear by writing it in first person. 
Despite the sadness and sorrow life had brought, it also brought lessons for us to learn. By, care, by carrying the guilt of what we could have been, we are able to ensure that it is done. After all, one cannot bear the weight of the world. So I've gone for something that's relatively very, very reflective and almost a little bit philosophical, to be honest with you, in that. Um, but that would be sort of a full marker. There's I've highlighted some of where the language devices are and um, where advanced vocab is as well. Um, so there's a lot going on in there. But essentially what I want you to take away from this is with descriptive writing, you don't need to talk about loads of things really, really quickly. Take your time with it and make sure that you squeeze out as much of you as you can. Right. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some questions um, whilst I set you off doing this, please, guys. So. Slido.com, there's the number at the bottom. What I'd like you to do, please, on the word cloud, I'll pop what you need in the chat function as well. I would like you to write anything that you think you should be including in your writing, in your creative writing, in your question fives. So, and I, whilst you're doing that, I will go through some questions. All right, answer that one, answer that one. <coughs> Excuse me. What is pathetic fallacy? Pathetic fallacy is when a weather reflects a mood. So for example, um, if you've got somebody who's sad, it might be raining outside. Um, if you've got something which is a very joyous occasion, it will be sunny. If you've got um, someone who's perhaps had an argument, there might be a storm, that sort of thing. Is drama linked with English? Absolutely. So we study plays um, from an English perspective, but obviously they're plays and they are meant to be acted out on stage, which is what drama is. A lot of English teachers end up teaching drama as well because they are so closely linked. Um, so, yes, they link very much. Um, right. What careers can you do with an English A-level? When it comes to A-levels, I wouldn't worry too much in terms of thinking about what careers you can potentially do with English unless there's a very specific way you are thinking of going in for A levels. So if you wanted to do English at university, um, so for example, I did English language and linguistics and I'm pretty sure that it wasn't a prerequisite to so something that you had to have to be able to do. Um, English A level. However, with English A level, there is it's incredibly helpful and there is a huge scope of things you can do and it it doesn't essentially close any doors for you. In terms of applying to universities, it's more what you do at university, which is where you need to be thinking about careers, really. So if you are thinking of doing anything sort of medical related um, or veterinary, then you need to be doing maths and sciences. But if you are thinking of doing something humanities wise at university, then I'd say the vast majority of subjects which are considered humanities. Um, so English, both Englishes, um, history, geography, religious studies, philosophy, languages, all of those would be brilliant and they wouldn't really close any doors for you. Um, you've then got softer sciences, um, things like psychology and health and social care and sociology, um, which has never been a problem for me in terms of work. I did psychology A level and it's not closed any doors for me. Um, and then you've got softer A-levels, so things like photography um, and travel and tourism. Um, 
and if you go for those and sort of just do those subjects then you might be a little limited as to what sort of courses you can get on at university depending on what sort of courses you are looking at so i'd say english just generally or i'd say personally do what you enjoy and what you're good at um i did english a level thinking that i would drop it and i took it instead of maths because i was persuaded out of doing maths and then i ended up absolutely falling in love with it and here i am so i think completely down to your personal preference and what you enjoy i did a very odd mix um i did psychology english language and music as my a levels and i did philosophy and ethics as my as as the one that i dropped um and it wasn't really a problem for me when it came to applying to stuff essentially what they what universities want you to do is to get good grades so i went to york university which is the russell group and i got abb and i got in um my a was in english um and they essentially just want you to get those grades so i did what i loved and what i enjoyed and what i wanted to pursue and it was fantastic and the best choice i ever made so Difficult question to answer, really. It depends on what sort of careers you're thinking of doing. Um, did I describe facial features? I absolutely did. There's lots in there, particularly two and four. Do you need speech marks of thoughts or only outlined for speech? Right. I would say in this, because I'm directly sort of trying to pull something out from a different perspective, I'd use it. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I think it's a nice way to sort of sandwich that in quite easily um how do you write advanced how can you write best be better at writing in an advanced way really really tricky one so i struggled with my creative writing when i was at school um purely because my vocabulary wasn't fantastic um and essentially what i did is i read and read um so i read a lot of, a variety of fiction non-fiction books sort of biographies of comedians when I was in year 11 and sort of teen chick lit um, and sort of romance novels and that's how I got better um, the other thing I say is go away and learn and practice using advanced vocabulary as well because that's where I also fell down when you're analyzing a text and you see pathetic fallacy or some other techniques how do you talk about the effect do you just say that it emphasizes Everything is there for a purpose, so you need to question why it has been put there and what effect it has and why it is helpful for the audience. What books do I recommend reading for GCSE students and covering that on the 28th? Um, do I prefer English Lit or English Lang? Um, definitely English Language. I didn't do English Literature at A-level because I didn't think I was going to be an English teacher. Um, but saying that, I actually I really love teaching English literature texts, um, but English language is my specialism. Um, right. <clears throat> what is zoomorphism? So zoomorphism is when you get, when you give something a specific action that you would associate with a particular animal. So for example, the sea roared. Roar, we would generally consider something that a lion or a tiger would do. Um, then, for example, if you said the man gnawed on some cheese, we would probably associate that with rabbits, rodents generally, guinea pigs, hamsters. Um, so that's what zoomorphism is. Cacophony. Now, I'm going to quickly Google this because I don't feel like I'm going to make a good enough explanation of cacophony so let's have a look a harsh discordant mixture of sounds so discord means um notes that clash so essentially a load of letters that clash together and give really harsh sounds 
Right, how are we doing on here? What have we got? Flashbacks, alliteration theme, oxymoron, tricolon. Yep, someone's asked me to explain what a tricolon is and I'm gonna do the same thing again because I think Google can probably do a better job of describing that. So, tricolon is a rhetorical term for a series of three parallel words, phrases, or clauses. So very, very similar to triplets, essentially. So hence why it's called tri because it's three. Right. Does changing perspective include flashback methods? You could definitely do that. Absolutely. Um, right. Do you need good get grades in English to become a doctor? Yes. I mean, I mean, sort of being a doctor is very, very difficult, isn't it? Just to get there um, and actually get into medical school. So with that, I would say I don't know what the specifications are for what they expect you to have, but I'd say probably at least a seven. Um, I would imagine for being a doctor, you'll find a lot of jobs with, they don't require a prerequisite for you to have an A-level in English, but they want your GCSE English to be of a high standard. So you might find that as a problem. Um, so the higher, the better. Right. Does OCR have a descriptive question? It does. Right. I allowed so much time because I struggled to get through all of your questions yesterday and I haven't got quite as many as I thought I was going to. Right. Anthropomorphism. Yep. Zoomorphism. Oxymoron. Thought provoking triple. Yep. Loads and loads of bits and pieces there. So that's absolutely fantastic. Right. So I think I've pretty much covered all the questions. So on the 28th, um, I think. Is it 11 o'clock on the 28th, Olivia? <laughs> I think it's 11 o'clock. Um, we are doing a revision session. So I can't remember what the other subjects are, but I'll be bobbing in for 15 minutes and giving my advice as to where to go to revise, how to revise, because English is really tricky to revise for. So I will be showing you a variety of books so I've got some of these. Um, I've got a couple of textbooks as well, some websites for you to go to, how to improve vocabulary, how to improve what you are reading as well. So you are reading something that is challenging. I think sort of the biggest thing I see in schools is year nines reading Harry Potter and only Harry Potter. And don't get me wrong, I love Harry Potter, but we need to get something which is slightly different and slightly, slightly more challenging. The more books you can read, the better, because your vocabulary will get better. I promise you it worked for me. And then I, I know it works. Tried and tested. Right. So if you want to know, I know a few of you have asked sort of how on earth do I revise? Come on the 28th. I'll be bobbing in for 15 minutes. Um, if you can't do the 28th, it will go up on YouTube anyway, like all of this week's sessions as well. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, so thank you very much for all being absolutely gorgeous as usual and keeping me on my toes. Have a lovely, lovely Christmas. How are we doing for time? Have a lovely Christmas and I'll see you on the 28th if you can. Anything else you wanted to add, Olivia? No, that's everything. Thank you so much, Vicky. Thank you. Have a lovely Christmas, guys. Goodbye. <laughs>